Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben McLaurin. I am the uh, one of the moderators for this evening's uh, series. Uh, a little bit about myself. I coordinate the Wellness, Resilience, and Survivorship Program at Cedar sinai and I will be one of the moderators for this evening's uh, webinar. Uh, in addition, we have a wonderful program that we're bringing to you this evening uh, as we discuss lung cancer awareness and some of the amazing breakthroughs that are on the horizon. Um, I, to get started, I would like to uh, introduce everyone to our special guests, as well as to uh, the physicians that are going to be on our panel. Uh, I'll get started with our special guest for tonight, which is Chris Draft. He is the former NFL linebacker and co-founder of Team Draft, uh, an organization leading a national campaign to change the face of lung cancer. Chris is an NFL ambassador and national spokesperson on health-related issues, including care and treatment of lung cancer, which claimed the life of his dear wife, Keisha, in 2011. And uh, Chris is going to be coming to you shortly to share more of his story of resilience and triumph. And uh, you will just uh, love him as much as I do. He's just an amazing guy doing amazing, amazing things across the nation. Uh, in addition, we have on our panel, Dr. Annie Balmanukian. Uh, she is the board certified hematologist and medical oncologist at Cedar sinai completed her residency and fellowship at John Hopkins Hospital, involved in phase one drug development clinical trials and have been involved with trials that have led to the approval of various immuno agents, excuse me, immunotherapy agents that are currently available for patients today. Immunotherapy has changed the landscape as to how patients with non-small cell lung cancer are being treated and is offering hope in terms of prolonging survival and allowing for improved outcomes in overall patient care. In addition, we have Dr. Sukmani Pada, uh, Director of Thoracic Medical Oncology at Cedar sinai completed her medical training, including oncology fellowship at Stanford University. Her research focuses in clinical investigation of novel targeted therapeutics and precise biomarker approaches in genomic subsets of non-small cell lung cancer, including EGFR and KRAS. I'm sure she'll explain a little bit more about what that means. Uh, in addition, we have Dr. Karen Redkamp with us, uh, who is the clinical professor in medicine the director of our Division of Medical Oncology at Cedar sinai She's completed her fellowship and master, excuse me, master's degree at the University of California, Los Angeles. Her research focuses on the development and of novel therapies for lung cancer with an emphasis on targeted therapies and immune-based therapies. Established as a leader in clinical investigation who performs hypothesis-driven translation research in thoracic oncology. She has developed studies to investigate resistance to targeted therapies and understand biomarkers associated with immune-based therapy. So that is our panel um, that are gonna be with us this evening. And uh, we will be uh, engaging with them in a discussion on lung cancer and the breakthroughs. We invite our audience to join in with your questions. Uh, feel free to add them to the chat and I will be reading them once we open uh, the discussion up for our question and answer uh, part of tonight's uh, event. So without further ado, everyone, I want to welcome you. I'm so glad that you're joining us this evening. And I'm going to turn this over to our special guest, Chris Draft, to share about his amazing story of triumph and resilience. And uh, Chris, take it from here. Ben, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And what, what an honor to be a part of this, this group, uh, part of this discussion. I, I want to thank Cedars right away for, for having this discussion, for having a uh, a conversation about lung cancer and lung cancer awareness month. 
You know, unfortunately, I, I would say that that would just be natural. That that that's just happening all over the country because November is Lung Cancer Awareness Month. But the reality is, it's not. And so, when we talk about the lack of awareness or the lack of knowledge, uh, it's because in too many cases we're not making people aware. And so, I I start off in saying that because. Why would anybody want to be aware of lung cancer? Why would they want to know more about lung cancer? Uh, I can say that I wasn't naturally trying to know more. Uh, I, I, no, I wasn't. I mean, I want to be honest. It, it, but in December of twenty of twenty ten, uh, my girlfriend at the time, Keisha, had a little shortness of breath. She had been challenging me to do P ninety X and run a ten k race with her, and as a former NFL player or really a free agent linebacker at the time, I was like, no, I'm not running six miles. I'm a linebacker. I run short distances, very fast, very explosive. But she said, you're going to run 10K. And being a good man that I try to be, that and uh, uh, basically a Southern man now, even though I grew up in Southern California, I, I just said, yes, ma'am. And so, you know, that's, that's how it works. So she was in amazing shape, 37 years old, and had a little shortness of breath. And instead of just in, kind of denying that it, was, that it happened, it, it was happening and, and just waiting it out, she recognized there was something wrong and she called up a primary care doc and went in right away. Uh, the primary care doc and, and gave her some antibiotics, but he said, you know what, let's to, to be sure, because you, you're saying that there's something wrong, let's just make sure we get a chest X-ray. The chest X-ray came back and she had a mass in her left lung. Two days after Christmas, December 27, 2010, we confirmed that it was cancer. And we found out the most important fact about lung cancer, and that is that anyone can get it. Now, if someone would have told me that before, hey, anybody can get lung cancer, it wouldn't have sounded right, because historically, the messages are all about just getting people to stop smoking and the connection with smoking. So that message would have seemed like something out of left field. But when I'm looking at my girlfriend right there, and they just told us, based on the biopsy that it is lung cancer, then you absolutely know that someone who's 37 years old in amazing shape can get lung cancer. And then unfortunately, uh, it wasn't just early stage. Uh, after a PET scan and an MRI, we found out it was stage four lung cancer. And again, found out the second most important fact, and I know we're gonna have a chance to talk about some of these things that too often it's found late stage, stage three and stage four. So my wife was stage four, Diagnosed stage four lung cancer. She went from challenging me to do P90X, run a 10K, and all of a sudden, just that quick, stage four lung cancer. She was tested right away for EGFR and out, so we'll talk about targeted therapy. January 2011, at that particular time, they already knew that that was the future. Tested for, unfortunately, was negative for EGFR and out, so she ended up on standard chemo. And Unfortunately, the way that went is that she ended up passing away a year later. So December 27, 2011. But before she passed, we had a chance to get married. We got married November 27, 2011. I think if you guys can understand what that date is, a few days ago was our 10th, would have been our 10th anniversary. On that day, uh, we made two commitments, one to each other. Uh, I mean, to each other. And the other one was to the lung cancer community. My wife asked me before we got married, she said, what if we don't get presents? What if we ask our family and friends to give to the foundation, the Chris Draft Family Foundation, where we set up an initiative that is focused on lung cancer? That became our Team Draft initiative. That's why I'm the co-founder of Team Draft, because the real initiative came from my, my wife, from the survivor. The survivor that wasn't doing real well, but at that moment, she knew that the that there had to be a change in that her battle, that individual battle was now going to turn into a battle where she fought for everyone else. And in fighting for everybody else, uh, it meant that now we can unload the connections with the NFL. She danced in the NBA and all of these amazing connections and put that force towards fighting against lung cancer and really fighting for the people that are impacted by that disease. So I am excited to be here because that's been our focus since that time is to go 
the lung cancer by loving on the people that are affected by it, that are impacted by it, not just our survivors raising them up, but really acknowledging all the people that have, you know, have trained for this battle. These amazing doctors that I have a chance to be on a panel with, I went to 60 cancer centers in the first year and people said, how could you go there? You just lost your wife. How can you do that? I said, because we are not, I'm not going to just sit here. We have the opportunity to move forward. And just because she passed, it doesn't mean that we can't make progress. And so I went to 60 cancer centers to say thank you. To say thank you to the people that have committed their lives to making a difference. And then I asked them a question. What do you need? How can I use all of the NFL? You guys know that the Rams have been tremendously supportive. How can I use the NFL to be able to move things forward? Because when we move things forward, it's not just that there's more research, right? I'm the first one to say that, you know, I, I love that there, there's all these great, uh, you know, we go to World Lung, you go to Target Therapies Media, you go all these things and all these great abstracts and everything, but all the research, if it's working, it means that people's lives are either being extended or the quality of life is improved. That's what I'm excited about. That's what changing the face of lung cancer is about. That's what we've been committed to since 2011. Changing the face of lung cancer is saying that prevention is not enough. We definitely have to make sure we keep you know, working on keeping people from smoking. We have to do that and helping them stop smoking. We have to do that. We have to understand radon. We have to understand other issues that contribute in terms of prevention, but understanding it's not enough. Early detection, screening, nodule, treatment. We're going to talk about those things. And then understanding that research is what drives all of that. They don't just happen. Things don't just show up. They don't just happen. It's because of people putting in the work. And why do we do it? We do it because of our survivors. We do it because of survivors. And so, again, I'm excited. Thank you for allowing me to kick this thing off. Thank you for inviting me so that we can elevate and celebrate these amazing people on the panel and hopefully educate the people that have jumped on the call. And, and I know you guys got questions. Feel free. I, I, I saw Lizette, the amazing Lizette. She said, put them in the chat. If you have your questions, wear out these doctors. They, are, they have so much knowledge. If you have a question, do not leave. <laughs> This time, this time that we have together, don't leave without asking the question. So thank you. Ben, thank what you, got you Chris. You are amazing. And, I, and, and as you said, I want to thank the NFL LA Rams for lending you to us. And your voice is so important in our community. You touch so many lives. I don't know if anyone has, has a chance to follow what you do, but you are at just about every city across the nation touching lung cancer, uh, patients, uh, awareness, churches, schools, temples, you name it, you're there. And I'm so proud of all of what you're doing. And I'm so grateful that the NFL LA Rams are, are partnering with us to help us get this message about lung cancer awareness, as well as cancer awareness and health in general. It's just a beautiful combination. And I'm so proud to be a part of this tonight. And so let's open this up to our panel. You know, uh, can anyone, and I feel free, feel free to, to jump in and, jump in and uh, offer a statistics about lung cancer and give us a back background about what's going on with lung cancer and how it impacts our community. And, and feel free, doctors, anyone that would like to, to go first. Doctor, I see Dr. Pata smiling and leaning forward. Let's, Feel free. Yeah, absolutely. So um, first, uh, thanks, Ben, for moderating. And um, Chris, thanks so much for sharing your story. I've seen you around in the lung cancer community, but never really heard you tell that story. So it was quite beautiful. So thank you for, for sharing. I just want to start with that. I think your message is so incredibly important about just heightening uh, lung cancer awareness, that lung cancer awareness can happen to anybody. If you have a pair of lungs or even one lung, you can get um, lung cancer. And we know that if we look at 
even cancer deaths within the United States, lung cancer leads in that horrible statistic for both uh, men and uh, women. So awareness is absolutely critical um, and it's important to know the signs and symptoms uh, that um, your wife experienced, such as shortness of breath and cough, because our prevention really and our screening tests don't apply right now to people who are so young and who have never smoked. I think Dr. Reckamp too wanted to mm. say yep. something. She was off mute for a second. So I, I would uh, echo uh, Suki's comments there. And I, it's so important to talk freely about lung cancer, often the stigma associated with lung cancer. I mean, I even for people who are not smokers and we're seeing up to 15, sometimes even up to 20% of people who um, get lung cancer are not smokers, though still the majority are. Um, when people get lung cancer, the first question, if you tell somebody, is going to be, I didn't know you smoked. And so, so many people want to keep it to themselves because immediately they feel like they've done it to themselves. Somehow they've done it. And I spend so much time talking to people about what they could have changed, what they could have done differently. And we don't, you know, tell a patient who had breast cancer, like how many fatty meals have you eaten recently? You know, we, we don't, <laughs> we don't, we don't go there with people and we don't put that shame and blame on people. So having open discussions and talking about lung cancer is a very big first step. Talking about research and funding for lung cancer is also important. Um, one of the statistics is that, you know, though lung cancer is responsible for more cancer deaths, um, there's still significantly more funding for things like breast cancer. And that's largely because of awareness. So we appreciate the work that you've put into this, Chris, to bring the awareness out here. And so funding for lung cancer becomes incredibly important. We're at the forefront with lung cancer in both immunotherapy, and Ani can talk more about that, and in targeted therapy. There are more targets in lung cancer that have specific FDA-approved drugs than any other disease. And this is in a disease where it's not so easy to get a biopsy. You have to you know, go into an invasive procedure. And yet we have made progress in understanding the biology of the many different types of lung cancers that exist, and also turning a very immune suppressed tumor into an immune responsive tumor. And I think I'll, I'll hand it over to Ani to uh, discuss that. Ani, before you go, can I, can I say just you know, one thing in terms of the this, this stigma? And you no, know, Karen, you, you, uh, you talked about that. Uh, you know, as we look at the numbers of, of lung cancer, uh, you know, American Cancer Society estimates about 235,000 people will be diagnosed with lung cancer in the United States. That works out to approximately 646 a day uh, people are diagnosed with lung cancer. Up to 20% will be people that don't have a smoking history. Uh, but then you're going to have a large amount that are former smokers and, and other ones that have a smoking history that are current ones. But I, but I want to make sure as we're on this, on this call that we acknowledge that in 1998, the cigarette industry actually got indicted. They got indicted for predatory marketing to our young people and for making cigarettes more addictive. And because of that, they ended up getting hit with two hundred for two hundred billion dollars. Two hundred billion dollars. So when we look at somebody that has a smoking history, the the reality is in 1998 we dealt with the fact that it's not just their fault. It's not that they're actually victims of an industry. So when we talk about stigma, there should not be an issue where we blame somebody because it literally has been proven that they're victims. And I think as if anybody on here has that connection in any way, I want you to know that I'm fighting for you. We are fighting for you. And regardless of how you got this disease, we got you. I couldn't agree more. And I agree with everything that I said. And Chris, I have to echo your uh, in, in power, incredibly um, powerful words. And thank you so much for sharing your story. And thank you so much for um, putting this all together and making lung cancer awareness a part of your goal. Because 
um, all the panelists here are, we're passionate about treating lung cancer and we're there with the patients every day. And just like Karen said, and just like you said, we're holding the hands of patients who are coming through and saying, how did this happen to me? Whether they were, you know, even if they were smokers, we have a lot of patients who quit smoking 20, 30 years ago, or they smoked for only five years. And, um, and of course, you know, and nowadays, a lot of patients who have never touched a cigarette. And so, um, you know, we're, we're there fighting for patients every day. The good news is that we do have more agents now than we did before. So the mm -hmm. landscape of the treatment and how patients are doing has come such a long way. Just the last 10 years has seen an incredible shift in uh, uh, how patients are doing. So patients are living longer. We now have statistics for patients who with stage four diagnosis who are, um, you know, on treatment and doing well, five years out from their diagnosis, sometimes even longer. And so those were things that we just did not see before. So immunotherapy certainly has changed the landscape of that treatment uh, paradigm. So patients are living longer on immunotherapy agents, targeted agents that uh, Dr. Reckamp and Dr. Pada can uh, discuss more. This, those have also changed the landscape. We have more targets now than before. Um, my passion of course is immunotherapy. And so that of course as well has been so important. So things are changing for the better, and we're all optimistic that it's continuing to move in the right direction. But again, awareness and more research is so important. So I have a question for our panel. <laughs> As someone who is, is, is layman in this area, uh, how, when do I get tested? How do I know about, uh, you know, when, what's the right age to be, be screened for lung cancer? And is there multiple screenings that, you know, different types of screenings that I should be aware of because it's a respiratory um, illness? That I'm on off mute, so I'll chime in and then I'll let you guys also chime in. But uh, that's such an important question. And unfortunately, we don't have any great screening uh, protocols in place for those who have never smoked right now. The only lung cancer screening available is for those who have a prior history of smoking. And uh, usually, any smoking for 20 pack year smoking history, and anyone between the age of 50 to 80 can get a screening CT scan. Um, but even though that has been in place, it's actually even that has not been utilized very frequently, even with patients who have a prior smoking history or are current smokers. For those who have never smoked, we still don't have proper guidelines in place for screening, and that's desperately something that is needed. So, yeah, Vienna, I, go ahead, if, Chris. If I, if I could just add some real uh, on that, Sylvia. You know, a, a big a big part of the group that actually can benefit from screening is our veteran population. And so, uh, again, as I said before, I mean, we we recognize that the cigarette industry got indicted for what they did. Uh, so when we we see those numbers that, um, you know, I, I'm the first one to say that my wife would have been not just able to get the lung cancer screening, but at 37 years old, she wouldn't have had a you know, mammogram. Uh, she wouldn't have had a colon you know, colonoscopy. So there's there's guidelines uh, that are in place for every type of screening. And so I think the key element uh, is to make sure that the people that can benefit from it, that we fight to make sure that we get as many of them as possible, because we know that catching it early is a game changer. Stage one and stage two can just, I mean, to be able to do surgery or potentially even radiation because it's so early can transform our, our, our survival rates. Yeah, Chris, just to add to what you and Ani have said, I think um, our current screening tests, we do have a screening test for lung cancer, uh, but it is underutilized. So within California, for example, the statistics around that are that less than 2% who are high risk and should be screened actually undergo screening. And if you look in, across the entire US, the national average is less than 6%. So we here have a screening test that definitely saves lives, um, but it's just not being utilized. And I think there is a sort of increasing awareness about how tobacco exposure may affect uh, development of lung cancer in different people. So the studies were done in patients who had a 30 pack year smoking history uh, who underwent then lung cancer screening. This was this big trial that was done and that was the population that was enrolled. 
But we know that there's group of patients, especially women uh, who can get lung cancer, never smoke, but even with lower smoking exposure. So just recently, even this year, uh, they've uh, decreased the threshold of smoking exposure to 20 pack years and also decreased the age of patients that are eligible to screen from 55 to 50. So this is all in an effort to capture, as you mentioned, those very early stage cases um, where you have higher probabilities of cure and can offer things like surgery or definitive radiation. And, and you've one been last, oh, so sorry. One, one last caveat to that, um, thinking about non-smokers, so probably the, the uh, population that has kind of the most non-smokers is um, in China and uh, Asia. And there was a trial presented from Taiwan that they looked at non-smokers um, or light smokers um, and looked for patients who um, might be screened for lung cancer. And what they found is that those with family histories, so it still has a risk factor, but those with family histories might be at higher risk and might be worthwhile for screening. And so we are getting, we're moving inching forward in trying to understand how to also diagnose um, non-smoking lung cancer earlier. We've been talking about cigarette as, as one of the key factors in, in knowing when to, uh, you know, those former smokers, but what about environment as a uh, influencer as well? Can anyone speak to that? Uh, ben, I think that's an emerging uh, field of research. In fact, at our World Conference on Lung Cancer in one of the plenary sessions this year, we heard that um, about 14% of cases of lung cancer are caused by air pollution. Um, as you can imagine, this could be a very geographic uh, variable because uh, there are, of course, areas within our nation and also within our world where air quality is better and where air quality is worse. I think about um, like, for example, New Delhi, where the EQI on average is like somewhere between uh, 400 to 500, which is extremely dangerous uh, for people's health. So I think this is absolutely an uh, emerging field of research. It absolutely needs more uh, study, especially as we think about even our climate changing. So this is another, you know, climate change is also very important as it relates to population health and also um, what we're going to be seeing in terms of uh, causing, you know, air pollution, causing lung cancer and things like this. This is a very good question, a lot to learn. But if I could add, add to that as you know, we talk about air, air quality, as a guy that grew up, I didn't just play with the Rams. I actually played with the Rams in St. Louis, but I grew up in Southern California. So for all people that are Cali folks, uh, it is a drastic difference uh, between air quality in, in Southern California now uh, versus what it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, and uh, we understand that policy changes can be critical in being able to deal with those things. Yeah. Uh, you know, it used to be almost like throwing a party to see the mountains that are just so close. Uh, but the, you know, the pollution levels were so high that it had to rain or it had to be Santa Ana winds before you, uh, before you actually saw the mountains. And so uh, definitely, you know, those are, you know, from the World Health Organization talking about the impact of, of air quality to, you know, to World Lung talking about that. Uh, we know that's a big deal, but the great thing is, I know in, in Southern California, there's been some huge changes uh, that have drastically changed the air quality down there. Thank you, all great answers. Um, before I open it up to our audience's questions, can we talk about any of the breakthroughs that we have on the horizon in terms of uh, how we're able to treat uh, cancer, lung cancer and um, in even screening, any breakthroughs that we are, are exciting or hope in this in this area? I think we're constantly looking at breakthroughs. Um, I, one thing that we're working toward here at Cedars is actually a mobile screening unit that we can bring. We we know that we do better if we bring the treatments or the or the 
uh, medical care to the patients. So we do that with mammography, which can be highly successful. So we're working on getting a mobile screening unit so that we can bring those out to communities and especially underserved communities. Um, so that's one big thing in technology. Absolutely, I would imagine there are certain groups that are disproportionately affected uh, more than others, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, is there any uh, targeted efforts uh, being done to help reach those groups of people? Ben, can I, can I, can I ask a question real quick? Because you, you asked about the, the changes that have happened. I know Dr. Pata is, uh, I mean, you're, you're working on, on targeted therapies. You know, so can you give people a perspective on, you know, how many targeted, you know, you know, you know, how many targeted drugs and how many targets that we have as it relates to lung cancer now versus 10 years ago. I say my, my wife was tested for EGFR and ALK January 2011. You know, Zalcori, which was you know, approved for ALK, was approved during that year, but it wasn't approved at that time. So it proved that targeted therapy was the future. Uh, and I know Dr. Adi to be able to talk about where immunotherapy is as ASCO in 2013. You know, that was the big deal of, of immunotherapy. So can you give people a little bit of like a history lesson about where we are now versus where we were? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great question. And I think this is also a testament to technology, our ability now to really interrogate tumors to a molecular level, not just uh, by looking under the microscope and also very, very clever drug design. Um, so as an example, if we look historically in patients with non-small cell lung cancer, the only target or potential target that we knew about was uh, a mutation known as KRAS. And KRAS has been just a notorious mutation, not only within lung cancer, but also a variety of other cancers to target. So we've known about that uh, mutation for a long time, and it's not until 2021 that we have now an approved targeted therapy uh, for patients with KRAS G12C mutated lung cancer who have been previously treated. So just to give you a sense from the time we know about such a target to the time now of drug development. Um, in 2004, I think was the biggest discovery for um, uh, drug development within lung cancer and really looking at molecular targets and that was EGFR. And so that uh, dramatically changed the scene where you are now offering patients in frontline setting with metastatic EGFR mutated lung cancer, a pill therapy instead of IV based chemotherapy. And now accelerating to 2021, we have a total of nine targets uh, with FDA approved therapies and two are completely brand new to the scene this year. Um, and that's one I mentioned, which was KRAS G12C, uh, and another one, which is EGFR exon 20 insertion. For years at meetings, you've been hearing about these abnormalities and tumors saying they're undruggable, we can't target them. And here in 2021, uh, there are actually FDA approved therapies. So um, it's been amazing in terms of the pace now of the discovery of these different subsets of the so having more precision therapeutics to be able to treat these types of lung cancers. And, and, and so can you, can you talk about the quality of life that, as it relates to, because these are pills that people can take and how that's completely different than IV based chemo. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great, uh, that's a great point, Chris. So for um, you know, of those nine targets, many of those oral options we can use in the frontline setting. Um, so instead of a patient having to come in IV once every three weeks, get labs, be seen in clinic, uh, spend the day in the infusion, uh, we see them. Uh, we, of course, uh, am, am, are also closely monitoring in the same way, just because they're pills, they still have toxicities and we want to make sure that we stay on top of them. But the uh, frequency of the visits tend to be uh, less so. And obviously there's a big convenience to be able to take in a pill rather than having to come in once every three weeks for IV-based treatment. So absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. I, 
I've, uh, like I said, I've been able to see so many survivors uh, that have been on those targeted therapies. So I, I was in Boston, you know, as you guys, some of you guys said in the chat, I've, I've kind of been all over the country, all over the world a little bit. And uh, that EGFR initial trial, I actually met the guy that was number four on that trial at Fenway Park uh, a couple of weeks ago. So uh, it, it absolutely tells you that research is working. Definitely we want it to work better and continue to move forward. But I think hopefully everybody on this call recognizes that we are building off of success right now. And part of that is targeted therapy. The other part is immunotherapy. I mean, uh, I, I think it's real hard to not see a commercial. Uh, you don't see as many Optivo ones now, but definitely see a bunch of Keytruda ones. But uh, you know what is you know what is immunotherapy, and why is that such a why has that been such a big breakthrough? So immunotherapy, as you said, is um, you know is everywhere. It's part of our uh, current mainstream therapy and standard of care that we offer patients. So immunotherapy, when when it hit the scene, it was. It's been utilized actually for a number of years, but not in the form of the medications where we use now, which we call usually refer to as checkpoint inhibitors. It's a different concept than chemotherapy where chemotherapy is intended to go and essentially attack the um, dividing cancer cells. Immunotherapy actually uses the individual's own immune system. So the uh, goal of the therapy that we use is to go and actually wake up these immune cells that are being essentially fooled by the cancer cell because we all have an immune system. Our immune system is supposed to recognize anything bad in the body including cancer cells, and it's not allowed to, it's not, uh, basically they're not supposed to allow cancer cells to grow, but these cancer cells are very intelligent and will fool the immune system into thinking that they're a natural part of the body. So our immune immunotherapy medications are intended to wake up the immune system, to let them know that there's something in the body that doesn't belong there, so that then the body's own immune system will go and attack the cancer cell. So basically you're utilizing the individual's own immune cells to recognize the cancer cells and get rid of them. Uh, the side effects are tend to be more gentle. Now there are some side effects with immunotherapy, but they're not the typical side effects we see with chemotherapy. And when we see responses, they tend to be longer responses as compared to chemotherapy. Um, I'm referring more to the stage four setting. Um, Speaking of which, when we start, first started using immunotherapy, it initially came to in clinical trials around 2009, 2010, and it was in 2014 that we got the first approval with Optivo. And since then, the field has really taken off because we have a number of uh, immunotherapy agents available, and we've moved beyond stage four setting to stage three setting, and now we have it um, in the adjuvant setting, we're looking at using it in the neoadjuvant setting. In fact, there's a trial at uh, Cedars looking at that. And so this is allowing patients to get better responses and for longer periods of time. And I'll just chime in that it's more than just better responses, but potentially more cures. And uh, with uh, immunotherapy, the remarkable thing is that there are a proportion of people who seem to have these long, long-term responses. We hesitate to use the word cure in somebody who's diagnosed with metastatic or advanced lung cancer, but it almost appears that they're getting to that point. And then moving it into the early stage setting, both targeted therapy and immunotherapy, um, the goal is to get more cures for people. And um, so it's, it's been remarkable. And we do know that people are living longer because of these therapies based on um, some reports um, that kind of move, look at therapy through about 2016. So um, the, the advances we're making are helping people live longer and longer quality lives as, uh, as everyone has mentioned thus far. Excellent, excellent. I, I'm gonna open this up to a few of the questions from our audience. And the first is uh, one of our audience says that uh, they're a non-smoker and would love to know what uh, my mutated ALK gene means and what would have caused my cancer? I don't know how much of that you can answer, but would anyone like to take that one? Yeah, I can, I can try to take that one. So um, there are different subsets of lung cancer that are defined by these driver mutations, meaning 
somewhere along the line, uh, lung cell has made a mistake uh, and this has initiated the cancer to begin and the cancer to grow. So ALK uh, rearrangements or fusions and occur in about three to 7% of patients with non-small cell lung cancer. And it is often associated with a never smoking history or, or patients who have a very light uh, smoking history. And we don't know the cause of, of many of these events. Why, why did the ALK fusion develop? We, we don't know. It's a very good, good question. And I think um, it, it signifies the importance of um, how to identify uh, screening modalities for patients who have, who have never smoking uh, lung cancer, including lung cancers such that contain the ALK abnormality. Thank you. So, I have Sorry. Then can I just ask, uh, but with some of the new therapies, can you talk about where ALK is? Oh, people that, that have that uh, ALK fusion yeah, based on the, newer drugs. What's the, what, you know, uh, stage four, stage four lung cancer survivor, biomarker testing, comprehensive biomarker testing, find out they're ALK positive. What's that a average, you know, life expectancy now? Yeah, so drug development um, in L for the metastatic setting has been quite, quite remarkable. There are actually many targeted therapeutic options available in the setting. And I'll actually turn it over uh, to Karen if she doesn't mind, because she's been uh, directly involved in some of this groundbreaking work and some of these approvals. So yeah, I, I would say that ALK is one of um, the most treatable, um, longest surviving for people even diagnosed with metastatic disease. Um, some of the retrospective studies show that the median survival is up to 80 plus months. Um, and, and again, generally with metastatic disease, we, five year survival is unheard of, and this is beyond that. Um, we have five approved agents, um, another agent that was recently approved in China. And um, these are all really exquisitely sensitive um, to ALK uh, translocations and often do work in sequence with each other. Um, ALK also is incredibly responsive to uh, chemotherapy, such as a, a drug called pemetrexid. And so we have many, many tools in the toolbox to help uh, people who have uh, tumors that, that have ALK translocations. So though we, we don't want anybody to be diagnosed with lung cancer and we'd rather cure it and have it go away, ALK is a very, very treatable um, alteration and, and uh, the progress that has been made in ALK is really astounding and something that people can live with almost as a chronic disease. Thank you, Karen. I just would like to also add to our audience that uh, I see your questions. And um, unfortunately, if they are a personal nature where we're, it's, I, I'm not able to share with the group, uh, just feel free to direct those questions directly with your care team and your physicians. Uh, and uh, we, we have to uh, buy by a group questions that are appropriate um, for a group. So we appreciate your understanding in this nature. Um, would any of our panel like to talk uh, briefly about how you're able to reach certain groups that are more disproportionately affected or impacted by lung cancer than others? I think there are some disparities there that I would like to know. Um, I've heard that it impacts the African-American uh, groups at a higher rate. Um, and I don't know if that's because of more, you know, people are smoking or, or is it environment or socioeconomic status? Uh, can you speak to that? So I'll, I'll, I can start the process. I think that um, so one of the things that we've talked about earlier is that um, California is number two. Um, so actually number 49 in uh, the rate of screening, those who are eligible. Um, just we are second lowest only to Nevada. And so we, we do very poorly in getting patients screened. And so I do think there's a, there's, and there's, and part of the reason that um, they've lowered the pack years and age for um, screening also is because of those disparities that it may take less uh, cigarettes um, to, for, uh, for black patients to 
um, have to develop lung cancer. It's definitely true for women that less cigarettes may, may cause them to develop lung cancer earlier. And so trying to get to some of those disparities on a public level by changing um, guidelines. And then as we talked about bringing out these mobile uh, CT scanners that we can potentially um, get to the populations. And we've done work, um, you know, unfortunately there are still pockets of um, underinsured people who can't get the same care as, as others. And there are, there are de different uh, uh, tiers that people have access to. So partnering with um, groups that serve um, underserved populations so that we can potentially get them into trials, potentially get them to screening. And um, our group also works with, um, sometimes works with churches and getting the word out um, in, in our communities to get to people who might not otherwise even have trust in coming to the doctors to get symptoms looked at or get screening in the first place. So there's a lot of work in that area and also work to try and get more access to clinical trials by partnering with, um, with groups that do serve some of these underserved communities. But I think um, Suki can probably also talk about targeting, making sure that everybody gets tested for targeted therapy as we have a huge um, undertaking here at Cedars to make sure that we're testing every patient. Yeah, Karen, um, you were reading my mind right there. So that's an, another issue with regards to disparities is um, biomarker testing, particularly for our patients uh, with non-small cell lung cancer. So as I had previously mentioned for metastatic disease, there's nine targets um, and uh, even one target in the earlier stage setting, uh, that's EGFR. And unfortunately, there was some data that was presented at our big oncology meeting this year known as ASCO, and only about 50% um, of patients are being um, tested for a limited set of biomarkers that doesn't even include all nine. And it's also, uh, they also showed some data that even if the results were available, they didn't necessarily guide um, the first line treatment decision. It didn't seem to impact decision-making for a subset of those patients. And there was also disparities noted that for um, African-American patients compared to white patients, the degree of molecular testing uh, was less. So I think there are a lot of um, factors that um, play into this with regards to um, why isn't molecular testing be, being done routinely? I mean, we've had such incredible advancements. We want these, uh, we want these diagnostics, we want these treatments to, uh, for every patient to be eligible to receive. And so one of the projects that we've been working on at CEDARS is to identify where are the barriers, even within the CEDARS network, because CEDARS of course is not just main campus, it has a variety of associated affiliate sites. And then not only just to identify those systemic barriers, but what can we then as a next step put in place to, to overcome those? So I think a lot of the, the ways to fix the um, issues with regards to biomarker testing is really putting systems in place to make it as easy as, as possible. So we, are, we do have ongoing efforts to identify one or two barriers right now, even within our system within Los Angeles to ensure all patients uh, who are eligible for this testing are getting it because it's so critical uh, to their treatment course. Bravo, uh, that warms my heart to hear these responses and, and to know, and I applaud, and I work at Cedars, but I applaud Cedars and I'm so proud to be working there because I do know I've been part of it where we actually go out to the community and engage churches and barbershops and places that are, um, that people rec are, are familiar with and, and are able to get the information in settings that, um, they're familiar with that they may have not gotten that information otherwise. So applaud your answer and, and I'm very grateful for what Cedars is doing in the community. Then can, uh, I, can, I, add, can I add to what there's, you know, what Karen and Suki had talked about, it, you know, as an advocate, one of the things that, uh, you know, as I, I share my story, uh, there's parts of it I share for a reason. And, and, and one of them, as, as I say to my wife, a little shortness of breath, and she went and 
to her primary care doc. And so she, the individual assessment that, that is necessary as we encourage people to be honest about what's going on with their body. And then the, you know, be honest enough to go into the primary care doc and make it clear what you're doing. And, you know, too often we don't acknowledge that that is advocacy. You know, advocating for yourself is acknowledging that there's something, there's something wrong. Advocating for yourself is going to that primary care doc. And, and in so many cases, lung cancer, it takes a little while for there to be a diagnosis. So being willing to go back and fight for that care. But one of the things that we can't have people fight for, if we know that it's a game changer, that's one of the reasons why I asked about the, the, the life expectancy in terms of ALK. It is too obviously different for us to allow people to not get tested. And so right now we've made it seem like it's difficult. Well, it's not real difficult. If it was breast cancer, they've made it basically a crime to not test for HER2 and you know a couple of other things. It's a crime. All right, and, and in this case, we've, we've learned that targeted therapy is too good versus some of the other options that it, it shouldn't be an option, along with too often as a being in the advocacy space, is they put that on the patient, or as I'll call them, the survivor, to ask for it, to fight for it. And I, I, I've thought that for so long that that's the most ridiculous thing, because you're literally saying that someone who just got diagnosed is supposed to understand uh, lung cancer at a level where they can go in and challenge their doctor <laughs> to make sure that they get comprehensive biomarker testing. And so that's unacceptable. So we have to be willing to hold each other accountable and make sure from a medical community that anybody that's not doing that, anybody who's not, you know, from, from biomarker testing, making sure that's done. And then Karen, as you talked about with the mobile lung cancer screening unit, we have to be honest about where those areas are, where we have, they have higher risk and make sure that they're aware. You know, again, it's not everyone that needs to be aware. They need to have basic awareness, but there are communities where they have to because their risk factors say, you are somebody that needs to be screened. So are we looking for those audiences the groups to definitely need to know it and we're directing the messages right to them. Absolutely. Absolutely great, Chris. So in, in terms of time, we have, uh, we would like to close out with Bronwyn, uh, one of our chaplains uh, at Cedar sinai But before she comes on, there was one quick question I from an audience member I did want to ask. And if maybe someone from the panel would speak to this, he's asking, he was talking to a lung cancer advocate and they said that low dose CT scans are now available and have an increased level of safety. One barrier to people asking is to be screened is the fear of the effects of screening. Um, is, this, is this correct? And if so, what is being done to communicate this info out to the public? And, oh. I, can, I can try and uh, take, so, so we, we use low dose CTs to decrease the radiation exposure. And so the, um, the risk is really quite low to minuscule. And um, they are available and uh, should be paid for uh, at least by Medicare. And um, the the fears of being screened, I think those are those are real and in part have to do with some of the the stigma. Right now, it's only for people who do have smoking history, and so people are not always willing to go in and advocate for their own health um, often. And so, um, they're, they're, and then the thought that what if this is positive, what does it mean? And that fear of taking that next step is often associated with it. I know there are, there are screening videos. We have some here, um, that have been uh, done by our radiology and pulmonary division here at Cedars. Um, it's also associated with tobacco cessation when we're working with patients, but it's a whole process to have a discussion about screening and what that means. It's not just go in and get your CT scan in a vacuum. And so um, get, getting screening is a healthcare process rather than just a, a, a procedure or an imaging uh, event. And just to add to that as well, I've had a number of conversations with our radiologists here um, in our center 
where they continually mentioned that it's really the additive effect of the radiation exposure from the CT scans. And for screening CT scans, usually the recommendation is once a year CT scans, unless there's something seen that's suspicious that may require a follow-up, a short-term follow-up. And so given, as Karen was saying, that the dose is low to begin with, and you really need a number of CT scans over time, overall, overall the CT scans are actually pretty safe. And the value of catching something early really outweighs any risks to the radiation exposure. Excellent, excellent answers. Well, I would like to thank everyone for your participation from our panel speakers to Chris. Uh, Chris, if you would like to say something prior to uh, Baran when coming on to uh, close out our evening, uh, I'll open the floor to you, awesome. our special guest. And thank you, and, and you know, thank you our amazing doctors for, for sharing with the group. Uh, everybody that joined, I just want to encourage you guys to uh, continue to learn. Uh, the knowledge is power and the fact that you're on this call is, uh, it's a big thing, it's a big deal. Uh, so know as, you, as you, you know, go away from here, know that there is hope, there is tremendous amount of hope. Uh, and you know, every day something is moving forward. And so, uh, well, again, thank you guys for being on here and, and thank you for being a part of you know, Cedars for having this Lung Cancer Awareness Month discussion and making people aware, being committed to making that happen, acknowledging that if we don't make people aware, if we don't let them know, how will they know all the things that have changed? If we don't, if we don't celebrate it, if, we don't, you know, if you guys feel my excitement, all right, hopefully you can. I know it's a Zoom call and I'm not right in front of you, but if, if you can feel my excitement because I know that the changes that have been made, when Suki talks about nine drugs, I'm thinking of nine that of people that are going to go to the weddings, that are going to birthdays, that are going to, I mean, they're having another anniversary, right? They're, they're, they're just living and they're going on vacations. And that, that's what that is. So I, I think of a CT scan and I think of somebody being cured and, and again, living their lives and being around their kids, being around their grandkids. So hopefully as you guys are listening to this discussion that you really take away that things are changing. No, it's not good enough, absolutely. But that's why we have research. That's why we support our amazing doctors. That's why we tell them thank you and encourage them so they can continue to think outside the box and move things forward. And know that every time we do move forward, those are lives that are affected. So thank you. Thank you for being on. Beautiful, beautiful. I couldn't, I couldn't close that out better, Chris. Thank you so much. And, and we look forward to continuing this discussion, you know, because as this is uh, ongoing, amazing work that is being done and uh, be encouraged, everyone. We're so grateful for the doctors and the amazing work that they're doing. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Bronwyn Jones to close us out. Well, thank you so much for this has been a really amazing experience to listen to everybody and in the spirit of this uh, thankfulness of the season. Um, I want to celebrate the spirit of passion uh, that we've been witnessing and the imagination and creativity of all the research and then the care of the patients that you've done is incredible. The imagination it takes to come up with these new ideas and this hopefulness and the connection in the community. And I'm actually just going to lean on the words of uh, one of the poets that I really love, Mary Oliver. Um, and her poem is it's very short and the poem is called Mysteries, Yes. Truly, we live with mysteries too marvelous to be understood. How grass can be nourishing in the mouths of lambs. How rivers and stones are forever in allegiance with gravity while we ourselves dream of rising. How two hands touch and the bonds will never be broken. How people come from delight or the scars of damage to the comfort of a poem. Let me keep company always with those who say look and laugh in astonishment and bow their heads. That's it, and thank you so much for everything. Thank you so much for your creativity, imagination, and passion. Thank you, everyone. Be well, and happy holidays. Take care. <laughs>